All right. Hello, class. Uh, this should be uh, Monday, uh, the uh, something of September. Um, so I am uh, most likely, hopefully, in uh, the Netherlands today, uh, giving an, another talk on uh, PDEs, uh, control of PDEs at uh, the Technical University of Eindhoven. So I'm visiting with uh, C. Weiland, who is, um, well, if you look up uh, LMIs, he's, uh, he, he's, he's a big shot in LMIs, so we're happy to be here. Uh, well, here as in where I truly am, as, as opposed to where you are, uh, which is uh, playing this uh, recording, hopefully. Uh, so today uh, I'm going to finish up uh, the lecture on optimization, which should hopefully allow you to um, do the workshop that uh, Brendan uh, has prepared for you on Wednesday. Uh, so if you uh, so you may recall um, that uh, in the previous lecture we went through uh, some optimization stuff. So we uh, started with the, the definition of the optimization problem. Uh, so the three things the... Uh, here, I'm like, uh, do my highlighting thing. The uh, variables right, of the optimization problem, which you have to identify. The choice of variables, of course, makes a significant difference in how difficult your optimization problem is going to be. Uh, the objective function which, of course, uh, depends on uh, your choice of variables, and it's uh, what you're trying to optimize. Uh, and the constraints, uh, which in this case, in this sort of mathematical definition, uh, are defined by functions. Uh, defined by functions, which depend on the variables, and map to some space. They can map to vectors uh, or matrices. In our case, they will often map to matrices, uh, but in the examples which I covered last time, uh, they uh, map to vectors or scalars. So the inequalities, uh, which uh, help define the feasible set, uh, and the equality constraints, of course, uh, depend on, of course, the space which the function maps to. So if it maps to matrices, these would be matrix inequalities, linear matrix inequalities, if this function is linear, and, well, they can be matrix inequalities otherwise. But those problems are generally uh, not very easy to solve. Uh, so that's, uh, that, that's the algebraic representation of the, uh, the, the optimization problem. So we went through some examples, uh, the previous lecture, uh, least squares, formulating it as a, an unconstrained optimization problem, uh, where the uh, variable is a vector, which is the slope of your line. Um, we didn't, uh, I didn't mention z naught here, which is the intercept, but that's also a variable as well. It's an unconstrained optimization problem. This one has a closed form solution. Uh, we also went through a slightly more uh, interesting problem, which is the max cut problem, uh, where uh, now our choice of variables is not entirely obvious. So we want to separate these two, uh, we want to separate our nodes into two sets and uh, we decided this is, a, this is a form of binary optimization. We're going to, our variables are going to be which group we assign to each of the nodes. So it's a binary optimization problem. Uh, we chose binary variables to be either negative 1 or 1 because that made the objective function slightly easier to formulate. So uh, if we skip ahead here to the objective function, uh, because we made this one negative 1, well, we, could, we, we add in the cut if these uh, two have opposite signs, and, we, and, and nothing gets added if, uh, if they have the same sign. So this is a, this is a fancy trick. Uh, it allows us to formulate the optimization problem. Note that this problem is, however, of course, uh, NP-hard. Right? Uh, we'll come back to what that means later. Uh, but uh, for now, we'll, we'll just uh, oops, um, uh, suffice it to say that NP-hard is, as its name indicates, hard. There are different notions of computational complexity, which we'll, uh, which we'll go over, which we'll, uh, we'll dive into in a later slide in this lecture. Uh, but uh, but the, this, is, it, this can be formulated as an optimization problem, but it is, in fact, fundamentally hard. So even though we formulate it as an optimization problem, in this form, that doesn't mean it's necessarily easy to solve. Now, 
it is solvable in a, in a sense and that there are, are, are codes which solve it um, but they don't they either have to sacrifice speed or they have to admit some possible error in uh, in the solution so the solution may not be optimal for, for, for big problems it usually is but it, it's not guaranteed the guarantee of optimality is really uh, has a cost for these types of problems in, in, in terms of complexity, time complexity, that is, um, number of steps required. All right, so then we talked about a uh, sort of control oriented optimization problem, specifically dynamic programming, uh, with a quadratic cost in this case, right? There's a quadratic cost, quadratic because it's quadratic in the variables. The variables here we've chosen to be x and u. Now this is constrained through, uh, there's a constraint, a quality constraint on the dynamics, right? the dynamics coupling uh, x and u together. So the x is not really an independent variable, but formally we think of it as a variable, but one which is go governed by this, by this equality constraint. We talked about that. Um, LQR uh, is a slightly different one where uh, we constrain, we add an additional constraint to our optimization problem, specifically that the input at every stage, step, uh, depends on uh, the state at that stage. So it's a static function defined by uh, a non-varying matrix K. And so actually K here is, our, is the only variable. We can, given uh, a K, given an initial condition, we can completely solve for x and u at every stage, and that will give us a closed form solution for this cost in terms of k. So really this is actually an unconstrained optimization problem when you formulate it in that way. But we've actually, uh, it turns out that those are equivalent to the principle of optimality, uh, which is a little bit of a deeper dive than we're going to, than we're going to cover in this, in this lecture. Right. So then we got to uh, we got to this notion of equivalent optimization problems. Right. So when are two problems uh, equivalent? Um, so the formal definition, right, is that two problems are equivalent if, given a an algorithm which solves uh, one of them, we can develop an algorithm which solves the other, or we shouldn't say algorithm, maybe that's too strong a word, maybe a black box, right, which gives uh, the problem data and spits out the answer, right, so if we have a black box, which given F, given A, given B, will spit out the answer, we can, uh, we can create another box which will uh, solve this problem, given F, given A, and given B will also spit, it, spit out the answer. Right. So that's, that's that. So let's see. Um, there were several methods. So this is, this is playing with the objective function here. There are several methods to constructing equivalent optimization problems. And one, another one is a change of variables, right? So we, we talked about the fact that uh, given a set of variables here, right, we can replace the variables here with another set of variables, uh, tx, we could call this y equals uh, tx plus c. I'm still getting used to writing on this Wacom tablet. Um, and a new set of variables, right, and uh, given, so given a solution to one, we could, so given a solution x, we can construct y, and given a solution y, we can construct x, and that's what's going on right here. So a uh, change of variables uh, is, uh, is, is a transformation of the optimization problem, which, uh, which, which allows us to uh, use solutions, use black box solvers for problem one to solve uh, problem two. Uh, another form of equivalence uh, being separability, right? Uh, if uh, we have this uh, separation, 
in, in dynamic program, we saw the stage separation. Uh, we'll, we'll generalize it now a little bit. Uh, separable objective functions. So if uh, if we can uh, pose the objective function as mean f of x plus g of y, so we separate these variables in the objective function, additive separability. And the choice of the feasibility of y is not influenced by the feasible, sorry, feasibility of x. Uh, then we can separate this into actually two subproblems, f meaning f over x and meaning over y, and then the solution uh, to this problem is just uh, this, the individual solutions to each of these subproblems, right? Another uh, another sort of way of thinking about this, right, is uh, we can write actually let's just switch to a smaller pen. We can write uh, min uh, over let's say x uh, f of x uh, plus we can move the min uh, oops, g y. So we can move the min uh, over x through, or uh, over y through the, uh, the the function of x over here to the uh, to the function of y. Um, if right, this function doesn't depend on y, and if feasibility of y doesn't depend on x. So that's, that's something. Right. So, uh, um, well, so this we're, this we're going to actually talk about in a little bit more depth uh, in this lecture. Uh, so the, the, the sort of dichotomy between or the, the non-importance of the objective function uh, in defining the optimization problem. So technically, here, let me switch back to color. Uh, you can uh, right, you can move the objective function uh, to the constraints right by adding a, a redundant variable, a dummy variable. It's often called t, right. So if here's your f of x, uh, here's your feasible set. Uh, so you're minning now over right uh, t. So here's your t, and you're fine minning t, trying to find the minimum t, such that there exists uh, an x in the set, right, here's x, uh, where uh, such that f of x, uh, oops, sorry, move over, such that f of x is uh, less than or equal to t, x such that. Uh, in optimization, mathematical notation, we often use a semicolon here to mean such that. No, it's just notation. Right. Uh, so then we add another example, which is the uh, support vector machine, mean learning pro machine learning problem, uh, which we uh, which we went through uh, just to, to show that this itself, uh, a subclass of optimization, can be formulated in the um, in the uh, the mathematical optimization framework. Right. So now we're uh, now we get to uh, the, the new stuff. Today's lectures. So let's see about thirteen minutes in. And uh, let's see. Let's go back to color. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is what I just mentioned, uh, which is the the this ambiguity. This ambiguity in in representation. So we chose. So there's a, there's a fundamental optimization problem which you're trying to solve. And uh, there's an ambiguity in how you represent uh, that optimization problem. And how you represent it off is often important, right? Because uh, say, say you represent it using f and g. So we decide on our variables, our choice of variables, which we can matter. Um, so we, do, we have a choice of variables. And that uh, choice of variables influences how we define our objective function and how we define our constraints. And here we've defined our constraints using inequalities, right? using functions uh, with the inequality constraints. And the inequalities can, do, can be various things, matrix inequalities, vector inequalities, and so forth. Right? So this is a sort of the classical uh, mathematical optimization formulation of the problem. So I don't want you to get 
tied up in this formulation. Uh, certainly, the, the reason we're discussing it is, of course, is because the, uh, the, um, we're going to discuss convexity next, which problems, how to recognize if a problem is solvable or not. Uh, and so I don't want you to get tied up in uh, solvability as defined by the functions f, how you define the optimization problem. So a, uh, an optimization problem is fundamentally um, fundamentally tractable or not, uh, and that sometimes uh, you, you, if it's easy, you can you can you can glean that information out of the representation, but not always. Right? So, well, if the representation isn't going to give you that information, right? Easy? Is it easy? Right? Is it convex? Right? Well, convex are the easy problems, basically. And the question of whether it's convex, well, sometimes, right, if these functions are convex, uh, then you can tell that the problem is convex. But if these functions are not convex, that doesn't necessarily mean that the problem isn't convex. And so, so often, a better way of interpreting the problem is to think geometrically about the problem, right? And this requires us to like think in terms of sets, right? Sets, right? Feasible sets. So the feasible set is a set of x such that this inequality is satisfied, right? So uh, really, when we talk about convexity, we're talking about convexity of the set uh, of feasible points, the set of feasible variables. And sometimes you can determine that based on these functions, uh, but sometimes you can't. And so it's important to think geometrically about what are the points, right, which are defined by these sets. Because remember, in the last lecture, we talked about redundant constraints. So say you have a, a convex function here, um, and I am getting ahead of myself admittedly talking about convex functions, but suppose you have a convex function defining this inequality, uh, which is uh, now I say that that means it's a convex set, you say, uh, but then you add a redundant inequality, right, a redundant, a non not necessary inequality, um, which, uh, which, which is not convex. So say, for example, we have a convex set here, right, and say it's a circle, right, we say we want x squared to be less than 1 or something like that, circle of radius 1. Right. So that's a convex uh, function, uh, it's just a norm, and it's convex set. Uh, but then we add a redundant constraint right here and says, well, I want it to be in this set, but I also want it to be in, I don't know, this set. Right. Right. So I want it to be at the intersection of these two sets. So when you add additional constraints, that, that means intersection. So x has to satisfy g1 and also has to satisfy g2. So I want it to be in this set, but I also want it to be in this set. Well, this set is convex, and this set is not. And yet the intersection between the two right, is just the first set. So the intersection is actually convex, even though the functions are not. Right? So it's often useful to think of the geometric representation of which points satisfy these inequality sets. And think about whether that what what are the properties of that that set, right? So, for example, right, uh, we could have um, in the previous in the previous uh, example of the the max cut, right? We had a let's see, I don't know. okay, we have a point here, and we had a point here. This is negative one. This is one. Well, okay, that's not convex. Right, but uh, so we had a very simple representation: x i squared equals one right, for that set. Right, uh, but this is a you know this is a rather complex formulation. It has relatively little intuition, and really, I mean, the set is just two points. Right, this is an overly complex representation of what is really just a very simple set. So often we'll come back to the geometric representation of the set and in its significance of what it looks like and whether it's convex or not. And once we've said that, well, the g function really doesn't matter. It's just an artifact of representation. Well, then we can ask the same question about the f. Well, does f really matter either? And the answer is not really. It doesn't really matter either. And for the reason that we talked about last time, that, in fact, 
uh, we could make this, we can move the objective function to the constraint by introducing a dummy variable. Right? Dummy variable gamma. So that here, what we're doing is we're looking for uh, the minimum, let's say here's our, here's our function, sorry. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, f of x. And we're trying to find the minimum gamma, right? Such that gamma is, uh, uh, there exists an x such that f of x is less than gamma. So we can write this, right, as gamma, right, the minimum gamma, such that uh, the set, right, such as a set, uh, which is defined as the set of points x and gamma, such that uh, there exists, uh, so, so, there, so the set of joint points x and gamma, such that uh, gamma minus f of x, or gamma is greater than f of x, right? gamma. Need to get better at this, such that uh, 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 gamma is greater than or equal to f of x. So this set, right, the set jointly in x and gamma uh, is non-empty. So this little notation here means uh, does not equal the empty set. So this set defined by gamma uh, is not empty, right? There's a point in there. There's a point uh, uh, in, in the x. Uh, which are where x is less than gamma, right? So you know, oftenly refer to these as sublevel sets or, or things like that. But this is a pure geometric representation where here we're minimizing over gamma such that we're looking at uh, infeasibility of the set. So we can take this like actually a little bit further. We can take it a little bit further. Um, this, this conclusion here at the bottom, right? Optimization. It's only as hard, I'm sort of crossing it out, but that's meant to be other underlying it. Optimization is only as hard as determining feasibility. So actually checking feasibility of an optimization, whether a point lies in a set. If you can do that, uh, most of the time, 90% of the time, you can solve the optimization problem. Uh, and, and for the reason on this slide, which is bisection. So suppose this, so this section is taking that pure geometric problem and asking how do we solve it. So suppose you just, uh, we have a black box, right? And that black box says, well, given, uh, a given, so given, uh, given gamma and x, uh, we can determine whether s of, uh, well, actually, in this case, just gamma. Uh, given gamma, we can de determine whether s of gamma uh, is equal to, uh, is empty or not, whether the, that set is feasible, whether there exists a point. Right. And this is, uh, this is significant because it, uh, right, it allows us often, if, if we're only, there's only a single non-convex variable, to solve non-convex optimization problems. And we'll come back to bisection qu quite a few times uh, in, this, uh, in this course. Uh, as a solution to what seems to be otherwise a hard problem. Okay. So what, what is bisection? So uh, right now it'll, it'll be on video. So when we talk about it in uh, several lectures from now, you can come back and say, oh, oh that's what bisection was. Right. So what is bisection? Um, so the, you do need a few properties for this to work, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, so bisection is sort of a way of, of of intelligent guessing, right? So you have a single parameter, right? A single parameter gamma, and uh, you want to, you, you have an oracle which allows you to determine feasibility. Uh, so basically what you do is you take, well, you start by guessing an upper and lower bound, right, for gamma. So you wanna, you wanna find, you're maximizing gamma. We're trying to find the maximum gamma such that uh, uh, the, there's a point in this set here. So this, uh, the set gamma uh, greater than f of x, right? The, the point we were talking about on the previous slide, gamma, actually that, that's already red, so maybe I should use black. Uh, so the set, there's gamma, gamma greater than f of x. Uh, so the set, uh, the, so the, the, the oracle will tell us, the oracle will tell us 
whether there exists a point x uh, such that f of x is uh, is um, is less than or equal to gamma in this case. We're maximizing before we're minimizing, but it's the same problem. So we initialize with a uh, with a gamma max and a gamma min, right? And uh, so this is gamma max, and this is gamma min, and uh, uh, gamma min, right? Is, so we're trying to maximize. So gamma min is uh, it has to be feasible. And presumably, gamma max is, it has to be infeasible. So gamma max is uh, too big, right? So this uh, gamma max uh, uh, is greater than the, the maximum of this optimization problem. That's the case uh, where this uh, uh, is equal to infeasible, right? So our upper bound, gamma upper bound. Uh, at that point, the set is infeasible, right? So that's, that's a no. Our, our black box says no, and at this point, our, our black box says yes. Okay. So we start. That's how we initialize the problem, right? We have to. You can you can start with them however you want. This has exponential convergence. Just choose a really big gamma and choose a really small gamma is typically the, the approach. Of course, you don't want too small because it'll end up being down here. That's a different issue. Um, all right. So what was I saying? Yes. So you have this gamma max and you gram them in. And this this is a this, this converges in an exp, uh, exponentially, uh, but it is iterative. So it's sort of like uh, uh, you iterate on the step. So you take the average. So you start with a, a, a range uh, where you know that the solution is is between gamma min and gamma max, and you take the average value of that, right? uh, and that is uh, at this point. Uh, the average value of your upper bound plus your lower bound divided by two. You from point in the middle, and you uh, you test whether that point, right, is infeasible. Whether s gamma uh, is infeasible. In this case, it's not. Right, there exists a point x such that uh, f of x is less than gamma, and so uh, we know that this is still. Uh, we know that uh, our optimal, our solution, right, will be. Um, greater than that point because that's feasible and, and, and it yields a, a, a feasible point, right? So we know that the actual solution is going to be greater than that. So now we can take uh, that point as our new lower bound. Right? So if gamma is feasible, our new lower bound is that point. So this point gets mapped down there. Right? And now all we've, what we've done is we've bisected the range of, uh, of, 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 of the range of possible values of the solution. So we cut it in half. And then uh, we return to, so we, we return to the feasible set. We take those two gammas. Again, we cut it in half. We take, a, take the midpoint between those two. This is our, so the, this is gamma one. This is uh, now gamma two. So that goes to uh, gamma lower bound. Uh, so this is our new uh, average value, right, again. In this case, it's infeasible, right? So there's no uh, no no x uh, where uh, f of x is uh, is um, is greater than uh, greater than gamma. So now this is uh, this point is not feasible, so it's an upper bound. Uh, so we map that to uh, gamma upper bound. So we now know again the, the actual value of the optimization problem is between these two points, right? And we cut down the range, the accuracy of our knowledge of, of where the solution is by half as, uh, again, right? And then, uh, then we repeat, so we now, now we're setting uh, that upper bound. So we, now our upper bound uh, is that point, and we repeat again. We repeat again, go back and in, and uh, let's see, uh, so that's, uh, that this is now our, our region, right, between there and there. And we cut it in half again, this point is feasible, so we set that gamma lower. Uh, now we, this is our, our feasible region. Uh, we cut it in half again. This point is again feasible, so now that's another gamma lower. Uh, so our feasible region is now this size, and you can see at each step, at each step, we're reducing the uh, area of the feasible, uh, the, the possible solutions by half. So at every step, we know that gamma star is between the upper and lower bounds. 
And the, the difference between our upper and lower bounds is decreasing, uh, where k is our, our step number, by, uh, by 2 to the k. Right? And uh, this is uh, exponential convergence. Um, actually, I don't think it's called exponential convergence. It's called something else. Um, it's, very, it's very fast convergence. It's a very good convergence rate. And so, you know, all, no optimization problem, uh, very few optimization problems typically give you the exact answer. They have convergence rates in their error. And this convergence rate is very good. So we could generally consider if you can solve, formulate the, the problem as, an op, as a bisection problem, uh, the problem is solved. Uh, so of course, uh, there's, uh, there's drawbacks to this, right? The first is, uh, of course, that um, there's a, it requires an oracle. Uh, the second is, of course, it actually doesn't give you the feasible point, right? It gives you gamma, right? Uh, if your if your oracle um, not only tells you feasibility but gives you the point, uh, then that that's a better oracle. And that will allow you to solve the problem. If it just tells you yes or no, then you actually when you if you go back to the optimization problem on the previous slide, uh, right? This optimization problem, I know how it's getting a little messy. Go away. If you go back to the original optimization problem, which is this one, your original variables. Remember, in this pure geometric interpretation, you've like eliminated all the variables except for gamma. Uh, so if you actually want to recover uh, the variables uh, from the, the original problem, which 99% of the time you do, you, your oracle should have a, uh, a way of popping out a feasible point as well. Uh, so that's uh, so that's that is um, uh, bisection, right? Uh, equivalence of representations. We talked a lot about that. So now that we're we're comfortable with those sort of equivalent representations, the fact that representations are not unique, that some representations are better than others, uh, that some rep representations allow us to solve problems and some don't, um, uh, we can talk about whether what, what we mean by solving the problem right so we can create a better metric for representations and uh, refine really what we mean by equivalent problems a little bit because just because right a solution to one will allow you to construct a, one problem will allow you to construct a solution to the other doesn't necessarily mean that um you know you have to evaluate how hard it is to take that solution and construct the other solution because it may right may take more steps in solving the original problem to take that solution and construct another solution. And that's an important difference as well. Right, so we, 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 we have to refine our, our definition of equivalence a little bit. So in order to do that, we have to talk a little bit about uh, computational complexity. So let's see, where are we? Switch back to actually maybe I'll do highlighting for now. That's always fun. Uh, so there's a, so there's never, several notions of computational complexity, right? Computational complexity, um, and, uh, and basically this is a metric for determining how hard problems are. Um, but it's more fundamentally. Uh, you, you, right, we're solving controls problems, right? And in this modern day and age, right, uh, most control problems are solved by um, designing algorithms, right? So, so you have a control problem, you want to define like a controller, right? U equals K, Y. Right? And again, I'm, I'm missing my, my T, so sorry about that. Hang on, there's my T, T over there. So you're finding uh, okay. Uh, this is this is actually uh, if this is the output of the system and this is the control. This is called the, actually the static output feedback problem, and it's actually unsolved. Right? We'll, we'll talk about it later, but it's an unsolved problem, and no one knows the complexity of this problem. It's it's thought to be NP hard, but no one really has a proof. And people occasionally propose solutions, but we'll talk about that later. So suppose like you propose a solution to this problem, this uh, static output feedback, static output feedback problem. First of all, uh, you're right, you're, you instantly become very famous, you're rich and rich and famous, and, and 
Well, not rich because remember, can't patent truth, uh, but just create some kind of heuristic to do it and like uh, just show that it works better than everyone else. And then you can, then you can patent it and just don't tell them that never publish. Right. Um, but anyway, if you solve the static alpha, you think they become instantly rich and famous, sort of, maybe not rich. Um, but then someone comes along and well, they try and implement your, your algorithm and they have a hundred states or then maybe there's a hundred outputs or a hundred states and only one output or something like that. And, uh, they, they run your algorithm and it takes, uh, they, they run it for like five days and it never terminates. And, uh, and then they get very unhappy because they paid you a hundred thousand dollars for your, your algorithm. Um, and it never, never gave you an answer. Uh, and then you tell them, well, you, I don't know, it, it takes forever. You just give them a smaller problem. I add my problem. It's not, it's not, it's not small. This is a, this is an issue of, uh, so you've proposed an algorithm, but it's too complex. And so when you, most results in control systems, right, are algorithms. And so we need a metric for publication in tech, right? So, uh, uh, TAC, uh, transactions on automatic control, IEEE transactions on automatic control, is uh, sort of the flagship, flagship uh, most prestigious journal in control. And uh, most of the, uh, the publications, there are algorithms to solve various control problems. Uh, but uh, if you try to publish an algorithm uh, with, uh, say, uh, NP, which is, which is uh, exponential complexity, uh, to solve this problem in TAC, uh, it will be rejected. And the reason is because that's generally considered not a solution. So there's only uh, certain classes of algorithms that are considered solutions to problems. Uh, obviously, LMIs is a class of algorithms, which is a solution. LMIs are okay. LMIs are good. Right, remember that? Are good. And I'll emphasize on some highlighters. Emphasize that one goes that are good, and uh, uh, exponential complexity is bad. Right. Bad. LMIs are over here in this uh, in this space right here. Right. So this is a, this is a good space, uh, and this is a bad space. I'll we'll highlight the good space. Make it pink. These are, good, these are the good ones. Uh, these are the very good ones, I know. So, okay, there's are different metrics for complexity. So first of all, when, before we talk about complexity, we have to talk about complexity of the problem, right? Because you can uh, propose an, a really bad algorithm for a really easy problem, right? So you can propose, that doesn't make the problem hard. Uh, so there are certain problems which are fundamentally hard. Uh, we don't know what, where static output feedback lies in that, We don't know where static output feedback lies in that spectrum, but it lies somewhere. It lies somewhere, uh, probably, probably here-ish. That's probably where static output feedback lies. Probably not polynomial time, but we don't know that for sure. Uh, so anyway, uh, there's a, there's several classes of algorithms. Uh, the easiest, the best, uh, are the logarithmic algorithms. So if we look at the uh, computational time take to complete. Uh, we, uh, what we map that is, is versus problem size. So in the sort algorithm, which is the best, the best known example of a logarithmic algorithm, they basically have a list, uh, say, of, uh, of, uh, of names, a list of names, uh, various people, right? You know, sort it al alphabetically. Uh, right? Uh, you can do that in logarithmic time. So what's the complexity? What, is the, what does it mean logarithmic complexity? So this could, again, complexity of the problem, which means as a function of the number of the problem size, of the data, right? So for example, when we, go, when we went to, uh, when we went to uh, max cut, right? Max cut, what's the data in max cut? Well, the data um, are uh, obviously the, uh, the WIJ, right? Um, but the problem size uh, is, is, is proportional is to, to the number of WIJ. And how many WIJs have, uh, do we have? Well, we have n squared of them, where n, what is n? 
n is the, the number of people we have to, to sort into two groups. So if we look at the complexity of max cut, we're looking at how the complexity of solving this problem uh, grows as we increase the number of people, n. Uh, likewise, in, uh, in sort, we're looking at the complexity as we increase the number of names. Uh, in, 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 in a logarithmic, uh, if this is our number of names, right, and this is the number of steps needed to, right, for a, a perfect uh, Turing machine needed to uh, sort that, that list, uh, logarithmic growth looks like this. So the scalability gets better uh, as the number of names increase. It's always increasing, the complexity is always increasing, but the additional complexity for every new name is decreasing as you increase the number of names. This is a log complexity. Right? Not linear, it's actually sublinear, it's better than linear, that would be linear complexity. It's actually not a linear complexity class, which is kind of weird. Um, but I guess it, it falls under polynomial, which is the next one. Right? So polynomial, polynomial complexity is everything above linear, but not exponential. Uh, that, that's not, not a good definition. So if I uh, like here, uh, do, 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 erase that, uh, erase the number of names. Okay. So uh, in this case, uh, what's a, a good example of uh, polynomial time complexity? Well, linear programs, if we have talked about linear programs. Uh, so let's say uh, our, uh, our LQR problem. Let's do LQR. We can solve that in, oops, in, uh, in polynomial time. And uh, here our problem data, our, the problem size uh, is the number of states. Right? Our variables, remember, are k, uh, which is uh, the number of variables, the number of elements in that matrix is the number of states times uh, the, uh, the number of inputs, right? So really, I guess we could put inputs too, but that gets too complicated. So that's just the number of states, right? And so in a polynomial time, uh, 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 polynomial time complex problem, right? We have, uh, that includes linear complexity, but that's rare. Uh, more common is like quadratic complexity, right? X squared uh, or N squared, I guess. And, or, or n cubed, right, or n to the fourth, right, any power of n, right, uh, in terms of our complexity is, is polynomial time. Right. So that's a, that's a polynomial time. And this is generally good, right. Why is it good? Well, that's sort of a historical notion, uh, but it's still, it's still, because we don't have to come up with a better one. We have, but it's, it's complex. Uh, so the story is, of course, that uh, polynomial time complexity, um, well, there, there, there was a day when we had something called Moore's Law, right? right and this dates to like the 1980s, uh, where uh, the, the, it, was, it was posited that uh, the number of, uh, uh, the number of uh, flops, right, uh, that uh, the desktop, uh, the, the best uh, existing processor could handle uh, per second, that's floating operations per second, and the number of flops that uh, the best uh, uh, CPU could handle would double every, uh, I forget what it was, two years starting, double every two years. Right. And if this was true, right, which it was for a while, right, uh, the, the speed of, uh, of processors was increasing exponentially, in, in fact, actually, uh, ra rationally, I think, rational increase. Um, and the, the, so the, the speed of the processors was increasing as 2 to the k. Right? And uh, so this is an exponential, uh, 2 to, to the exponent k. And, uh, and of course, the, the funny thing about exponentials is that they always increase faster than polynomials. Right? So that uh, your polynomial, well, it may start off fairly large, but it never grows as fast as an exponential. So an exponential will always surpass any polynomial eventually. Right? And so the theory was that uh, if, if, if floating operations per second were doubling every two years, eventually uh, 
for any problem of any size, there would be a processor which would solve it relatively efficiently. Now we know that this, uh, you know, starting in like uh, uh, Moore's law started failing. Uh, I don't know if when it failed, maybe uh, 2005 or so, right? 2010, right? Where the uh, the, 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 the 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 increase in, in floating operations per second for various reasons uh, started to look more like a logarithmic increase. And in fact, uh, recently it's, it's, it's actually gone, it, it, you could argue that it's gone down. Okay. So originally it was increasing exponentially, but now it looks more like that. And there's fundamental reasons, right? The, the size of a transistor was decreased so much that uh, you, couldn't, you just couldn't shuffle away heat fast enough from the transistor. Uh, and it just got too expensive to produce faster processors. Um, and so no one's making fast processors anymore. What they're doing instead is, uh, is doing multi-core. Uh, so you get more flops, but that's not quite the same thing, right? A multi-core processor is not the same as a single core processor, right? Because they have to communicate with each other and you can't do sequential operations. And almost all optimization problems are sort of fundamentally sequential problems. So, uh, the, uh, so Moore's law has failed uh, in truth. There's a new complexity class, Nix class, which is like way somewhere or intersecting here, Nix class, which is sort of the, the, the easily uh, distributed processes, uh, problems, uh, but very few problems actually lie in there. Uh, so that's, uh, that, 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 this, this is the easily parallelizable problems. Very few of them. Simulation, however, is relatively easy. Uh, those uh, those fancy uh, video games you play on your desktop with the fancy graphics simulate those are simulations, uh, and so that those are really those are pretty easy um, to to parallelize, but very little else. Right? Anyway, so, so uh, in lack of a, a better metric for algorithms, we still look at whether uh, if you want to publish in TAC, uh, your algorithm is polynomial time. Now there are ones that are harder, and we can like uh, we can uh, we can go through this, but there's not much point. Uh, there's NP hard, and there's NP complete. Let's talk about that a little. Oh, sorry, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I circled the wrong one. Uh, so th this is the uh, this is the one we want to be in. Okay. Uh, so giving a little bit harder uh, the NP class. Uh, so this is the number of which number, the problems for which you can verify. Given a solution, you can verify whether that solution is, is a solution in a polynomial number of steps. Right? Um, and that, uh, is, that sort of spawns the question of, well, feasibility, if I can verify, is that the same as solving the problem? And uh, that's a famous question. Right? Is P equal to NP? Are those two? And that is unknown. Right? Uh, people are always, again, proposing uh, proofs that either P equals NP or P doesn't equal NP, and they're all wrong. Um, if you were to prove either one of those, you'd be instantly famous and rich and so forth. But uh, it's, it's unlikely to happen. Uh, so NP, uh, we don't know where that lies. Uh, within that NP uh, area, um, there is a class of NP complete problems. So basically, there's a bunch of problems which are in NP and are all equivalent to each other. Right through uh, equivalent to each other uh, again. Given a solution to one, you can you can solve another. And here, equivalently, I put a little star next to it, uh, which means uh, equivalent in the sense that we can reduce one to each other. Given a solution to one, we can find a solution to the other. Uh, where the number of steps needed to construct the other solution is itself a polynomial is polynomial, right? In the in the size of the problem. So. The algorithm for moving from solution A to solution B is, uh, is uh, itself polynomial time. All right. So that's, uh, that's the class NP complete. There's a bunch of very useful problems. Uh, traveling salesman's in there. Uh, Max Cut is in there. A very l large class of very useful problems, which we'd all like to solve, uh, is in the NP complete box. And they're just waiting for someone to show how you can solve NP problems using P, but that will never happen. Uh, so really, actually, uh, I should swap the order of these two. 
beyond NP complete are the NP hard problems, which means that given a solution to an NP hard problem, I can construct a solution to an NP, all the NP complete problems. Right. So they're all at least as hard as NP, but they're probably a little bit harder. Uh, actually, traveling salesmen in, um, in, in NP hard. Well, actually, I need to look check that. I'm not sure whether traveling salesmen. I have it in all three for some reason. That can't be true. Uh, it can't be NP hard. Well, I guess it, technically NP hard. All NP complete problems are NP hard. Right. Uh, okay, fine. Whatever. Um, next, uh, we have uh, exponential time and exponential space. And here we start uh, thinking more uh, about how bad things are getting, and uh, we can think a little bit more about uh, how bad they're getting in terms of complexity. Uh, so chess is an example of complex, exponential complexity in steps, uh, and then there's exponential complexity in uh, memory. And you know, we, have, we start differentiating between them because it becomes important when you get really bad algorithms. Right? And they're bad in what sense? Um, so most of our algorithms uh, are bad in both, <laughs> quite honestly. But uh, the, sometimes uh, they're good in one and, and bad in the other. Yeah. All right, so that's like, uh, that's, wow, well, uh, this is a very messy slide now. A rundown of all of sort of like the metrics for how we think about the complexity of problems. Right. All right, so now uh, that we've, uh, we have set a way to judge uh, problems, uh, we can start talking about, uh, we can start judging problems, right? We can start judging things. Uh, and really, uh, we're going to ditch, uh, we're going to start ditching hard problems uh, in favor of, uh, of, uh, of convex problems. Okay. So which problems are easy? So let's look at the, look at them a different, I mean, remember there's three different formulations of the problem. Right? Start using highlighting. Get rid of my straight marks here. So uh, there's three different formulations of the problem. There's the sort of a functional representation. Uh, there's a geometric representation where our, our set is a, is a set, or a feasible set is a set. And then there's a pure geometric representation where we've eliminated all the variables except, uh, except for gamma, essentially. So uh, in this case, um, the answer is the same for all of these, but with, with some small variations. Now you notice they all have the word convex in it. Right. So let's start actually with the uh, geometric uh, representation. So basically, uh, we can say fairly, fairly easily, uh, if our number of variables is finite, and this is actually occasionally not the case, right? we have infinite dimensional variables occasionally, but in most cases it is, they're finite dimensional. Uh, the problem is easy if uh, the function is convex. We're searching, we're minimizing convex function, and the set is convex. So convex function, convex set. Right. Easy. Uh, and that's, uh, it's not all the easy problems, but it's pretty close to all the easy problems. Right. Um, so there are very few problems which are easy, which are not, don't have a formulation that, that satisfies this. And there's a, some caveats, there's quasi-convex problems, and uh, but there's very few. Read, read Boyd's convex optimization. He'll, he'll enunciate a few other ones. Right? That's one of the textbooks, remember. Uh, so, OK, well, uh, you may say, well, this is like a little bit tricky. How do I verify that uh, my set is convex? And here, where this is where the functions are useful. How do I verify this? Red. How do I verify that whether a set is convex? Well, we'll, uh, we'll talk about the, the actual definition on the next slide. Um, one easy way is to determine whether uh, the function is, is convex, the function g is convex. h uh, has to be linear, right, because uh, it's an equality constraint. So h has to be linear. Uh, I say affine. Affine means uh, a, h equals uh, a transpose x. That's a linear function uh, plus b b is the affine bit, right? So the difference between a linear function and an affine function is whether it intersects zero. So right, that's the difference. And then, of course, uh, the pure geometric representation, uh, it's solvable if the, if the set is convex. So. Right, so, uh, okay, now we, uh, I said I've defined every, you know, whether problems are solvable in terms of whether they're convex or not. 
but I haven't actually said whether a con what a con what what, what's, what does the word convex mean? Uh, this is uh, this is very dubious of me. I should have maybe reordered my slide slightly. Uh, there's the word convex. We're defining convex here. Um, we have to define it separately separate, because there's a different definition depending if you're talking about a set of points or you're talking about a function. So the function is not necessarily a set of points, so I guess you could have a set of functions, but that's not what we're talking about. Okay. So, um, so for a function is convex. Uh, so there's several different characterizations of convex, but fundamentally, right, the one you can always test is this one. Right. Whether the value of the function at a weighted average of any two points, right, there's a weighted average. Uh, so the, the weight is between 0 and 1. So, uh, so we either weight, z the weight, weight x between 0 and 1, and then uh, the weight on x2 is, uh, is 1 minus this weight. Right? So, so the, the sums of these two terms add up to 1. So the weighted average of x1 and x2, the value at that weighted average. So we take point x1, take point x2, right? And any point, uh, so weighted average, so this is x1, right? x1, this is x2, right? Uh, and the weighted average, right, is a point between them, weighted average. And so the value of that function at that weighted average, right? That's, that's this bit. Right there, uh, is uh, has to be less than or equal to, right? Uh, the weighted average of the value of the function at x one and the value of the function at x two. So uh, this is a value, right? It's a linear function, weighted average, right? So it's the oops, right? so the weighted average. Of those two points, I don't know why it's like unhappy with me. Weight average of those points is this point right here, and so the value of the actual function has to be less than uh, this point right here. Right. And you can see the red function, it's not. Right. The blue function, it is. So we take this is a. I don't know why it's doing that. Uh, so we take. I think I'm like not tilting my pen enough. Right, uh, f of x1, uh, where is it, f of x2, draw the line between them. I'm sorry, I'm very bad drawing lines. And so this is the weighted average, right, of those two points, and the actual value of the function lies below that. Right. So this is a convex function, and this is not a convex function. Now, this, uh, this function over here is, a, is actually quasi-convex, and so there it is sort of so, so, so that means its level sets are, are, are convex, but we're not going to get into that. You read Boyd's book if you're interested. But you can actually optimize these things because it does have a global minimum. But anyway, uh, so that, but that's the definition, right? The, that weighted average has to low, lie below the function. Uh, here again, a good, uh, good illustration, right? x1, x2. Right. And the weighted average, so the weighted average of those functions, but the same weight, value of the function, right? That's the weighted average of the values, and this is the value at that weighted average. Right. It's less than. So this is a convex function. This is not a convex function. So obviously, you have, this has to satis this has to uh, this has to be satisfied for all weights, for all points x1, and for all points, uh, sorry, all points x1 and all points of 2. Actually, I didn't say that, right? For all x1, comma, x2, right? Uh, in, the, in, the in the set, in the feasible set. All right, so that's, uh, I, I should have mentioned that, but uh, so you, that's hard to verify because you have to say it, there's a lot of for alls there, right? This, uh, by the way, this is a mathematical symbol for for all. There's a lot of for alls there, so you have to verify that every value of, of gamma, lambda, and every value of x1 and x2. How, you, how would you possibly do that given? You're given a function, you don't know very much, right? Now, how do you verify? Okay, so uh, there's actually a question on that in the homework, which I will give about eventually. But uh, so there's a, a couple, tri a lot, a uh, bunch of different tricks to determining if uh, if a function is convex. Uh, the most commonly used one, I would say, is this one. Right? 
Um, so basically, uh, what this says is, well, in multiple dimensions, it's saying multiple dimensions. Uh, in, in a single dimension, right, right, the second derivative, the inflection, the curvature, right, the curvature of the function is greater than or equal to zero for all x. That implies convex. Right. The, that means the slope is always increasing. Right. Right. So here the slope is very negative. It's getting less negative, less negative here at zero, and it's getting more positive, more positive, more positive. Right. The rate of change of the slope is always positive. The, the, the change in slope as we move along x is always positive. That's uh, by far, I think, the, the most commonly used test for convexity. Sometimes you can find ways of verifying this. So the, the, these two are probably the, uh, the most common tests for convexity. Taking the Hessian, in multiple dimensions, this is the Hessian. It's a matrix, and it has to be positive. It's a matrix, so it, you want it to be positive semi-definite, uh, not just because it's not a scalar. You can't just say positive. So the, we have a notion of ma matrix positivity because it's a matrix. Uh, aside from that, right, uh, uh, you know, if this is hard, right, uh, to tell, uh, there, there's other, other ways to doing it. Um, basically, you can take pieces, you can break the function down often into pieces and look at the individual pieces and tell if those are, if those are convex or not. So, for example, uh, if f1 and f2 are convex, then the sum of f1 and f2 is convex. Uh, some functions which are all known to be convex, the norms are convex, exponentials are convex, uh, powers are convex, uh, uh, log, negative log is convex, uh, only convex, by the way, on, uh, so negative log looks like, right, log looks like that, negative log looks like that, so obviously it looks convex. Uh, it's not defined for x less than zero, so it doesn't exist there, so that's not so helpful. Um, Let's see. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this is uh, the powers are convex when power is greater than one and less than zero. So that's, the, that's when it's less than zero, that's like a rational function going down like that. Uh, in between, actually, uh, fractional powers uh, are, can be, can be con are usually concave. Uh, which, uh, so concave means the, the negative of the function is convex. Uh, let's see what we're saying. Uh, Point-wise maximum, right, I'm getting kind of messy here, and see if I can find the number of rays. Right, Point-wise maximum, uh, let's see, here we go. Uh, so you have two, uh, two convex functions there, uh, one, two. Uh, the point-wise maximum, right, oops, maybe I should draw a little bit better, uh, is the, 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 uh, the maximum of those two functions. So it's like at this point here, it follows there. Do, 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 do. So now this point, this function starts getting larger, so it follows that one. So it's a point-wise maximum, so you can see that that function looks convex-ish. Point-wise maximum. Uh, and uh, composition, it's not always closed under composition. So composition of two convex functions is not necessarily convex unless uh, you have that the second function is increasing. So a function, uh, if f1 is increasing, f2 is convex, uh, then the result is convex. So again, uh, if you can, there's sort of tricks, uh, if, you can, if you can break it down into simpler convex parts, uh, you can sort of build up convexity. So that's a, that's a function. Uh, the set is actually a little bit easier to test. Um, where's my cursor there? Uh, let's see. Let's go there. So a set is convex. Uh, basically, if uh, the weighted again, it's a weighted average, right? Uh, so a set is convex if if the weighted average of any two points in the set uh, lies in the set, right? And the weighted average. This is scalar weight uh, mu. And again, this is uh, for all, oh it, this the, for any x y for l and for any has a, a sort of a, a same meaning, but. Uh, it's hard to find a difference between those two meanings. Anyway, uh, for any x and y, uh, this uh, this weighted average is in the set uh, for all uh, weights between zero and one. So basically, what that means is that if you draw the line connecting those two points, right, that line has to stay in the set. Right. So you can see this is a convex set because you can take any two points. There's no no point where you can't take uh, any two points. It, it, it lies in the set. 
Um, so that's that's actually the, 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 geometrically, it's it, it's really easy to think about it. Um, algebraically, it's a little bit trickier. Uh, if f is a convex function, then the set x such that f of x is less than zero is a convex set. Right? And you can verify that just by applying the definition of convexity to this function. Uh, but uh, again, it's a little bit trickier because you're looking at uh, the convexity of a function. And it's a little bit easier to see convexity of a set. Um, building up uh, convex sets. Uh, let's see, we have a convex set here, a convex set here. Uh, the intersection, so the set of points in both sets, is convex. Right? Intersection is convex of two convex sets is con retains convexity. The union does not. So the union is, take two points, it's a set of points in one or in the other. Right? And, and of course, obviously, if you chose that point, uh, actually you gotta switch colors here. If you choose uh, this point here, right, and this point here, right, you can draw the line between them. Obviously, it leaves the set. So the union is not, does not perverse, preserve convexity. Uh, the slide on more, more on convexity. No. Uh, so just like uh, a couple more examples of uh, convexity, uh, convex sets. Uh, so if I say, for example, we take here the donut, um, is that set convex? So we're here we're talking about the points or the points here. Is it convex? Well, if you're I was in class, right, I could ask this question, but obviously I'm not, so I'll just have to tell you the answer. Obviously not, right, because I can take um, I can take this point, I can take this point, I draw a line between them, and it leaves the set. It comes back in, but it leaves the set. So, uh, yeah, so the convex set, what else could you say about convex set? Um, so, positive orthant, right, convex. Uh, any, uh, any set defined by inequalities, right? X greater than or equal to B, right? No matter, uh, one of our basic notions of, posit of what positivity must mean, uh, basically, a, a no we can define any convex set can be used to, uh, convex cone can be used to define a notion of positivity. Uh, and likewise, any of our existing definitions of positivity define a convex set. So, a convex cone, actually. Uh, so, that's uh, any notion of positivity. And then uh, you can have a linear transformation of that. And a, so, that's a transpose x. That also defines a, uh, a convex set. All right, so those are, that's the definition of convexity. And uh, the question is, uh, why, are we so fuss why are we fussing about convexity so much? And the answer is basically convex optimization problems is a set of optimization problems which we know how to solve right? um, in polynomial time. Right? And why do, we know, uh, why do we know how to solve these problems? Well, the answer is because, um, uh, well, there's a couple answers to that. Um, the, the easy one is descent algorithms converge. In convex optimization problems, there's only a single, there, there are no local minimum. There's only one point, right? There's only one point. Uh, uh, so if you, if you get to a point and you can't do better than that point, if you get to a point and you can't do better than that point, and the problem is a convex, you can't do locally. If you look around you, like every direction, at least like a meter or something like that, uh, you know that, uh, that this is the solution, not just locally, but, but globally. The difference between global and local optimization problems. Um, so that's, uh, why, why is that important? Uh, because we have most optimization algorithms are, are termed, termed uh, descent algorithms. So basically, uh, descent algorithms work by uh, they, they, you have an initial feasible, uh, initial starting point, right? This point X. And you take the, uh, you look at the, uh, the value of F at that point, and you take its derivative, right? And you notice that F is decreasing this way and increasing that way. And so you take a little step this direction because that should cause you to decrease F. And uh, that gives you a new point, right? And you, you evaluate the, the slope at F at that point. And you notice it's decreasing that way, increasing that way. So you take another step this direction, right? 
and you, you've improved your value of f uh, by going that direction. And you uh, take the slope again and again and again and again and again. And at some point, the slope stops uh, giving you information. It, it becomes zero. Right? And you get to a point where the, the slope of f of x equals zero. And you can't do any better. Well, technically, you could also get to uh, the, the limit, the edge of the set. Right? So this is set. You could get to the edge of the set. And... Uh, and uh, that would also be a stopping point because, uh, well, you can't go any further this direction. If you go back this direction, the function increases. So this is a, both of these are local optima, right? They're locally optimal because if you go in any direction a just a little bit, uh, you're going to do worse. Right? And the, 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 the advantage of convex optimization is that local optima are global. Uh, so if you're a local, there's only one uh, one local optima, and that's the global optima. Um, local optima are global, right? Which means that if you do this stupid approach, right, you just keep looking which way the, the function is decreasing, uh, eventually you're going to get to a point where the function is not decreasing anymore, and then you can just stop and assume that that's the global optimization problem, because it is in, a, in the convex case, when the problem is convex. Right. Uh, and this is basically the best that optimization algorithms can do. Right. They're very dumb. Right. They just uh, look for uh, way, directions where the function is decreasing and take a step in that direction, maintaining yourself in the feasible set. Right. So these are the class of algorithms for which, uh, class of problems for which dumb algorithms work. Uh, algorithms really don't know anything about the model. Now, if you do know, if you don't, you, the algorithms can get a little bit smarter. So, for example, the first algorithm, optimization algorithm, uh, was actually a Newton's algorithm. So, of course, Newton's algorithm, you probably learned it, right? It's uh, it basically uh, takes your function, it linearizes it at a point, it assumes it's linear everywhere else, and it solves for the point where f of x equals zero. So it, uh, it, 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 it's looking for the point where f of x. It's a root-finding algorithm, right? Assumes the problem is linear. Finds the root of the linearization. Uh, assumes that's the next step. Uh, linearizes again at that point and, and, and continues. Um, so Newton's algorithm actually applied to optimization is quite useful because, right, in our case, we're actually looking for the case where f of x, and the, the gradient of f of x equals zero, right? That's where the, that's the point of inflection. So, you know, there's a minima have to occur at this point of inflection when the gradient is zero, or they have to occur uh, at the, uh, the boundary of the feasible set. In any case, uh, Newton's algorithm attempts to solve for uh, this point f of x equal to zero, right? This is Newton's algorithm applied to uh, nabla of f, right? You've seen Newton's algorithm before. It's usually, uh, there's not the delta squared there, the nabla squared. Uh, but uh, but because we're searching for the root of f of, delta of f of x, that's why it looks a little bit different. Uh, but uh, Newton's algorithm actually converges extremely quickly uh, if it converges, but it doesn't always converge. It's not guaranteed to converge. You have to add a little step size, so you have to say, "Whoa, tone it down, Newton." Uh, so you have a little tau there, tau less than one, All right, to slow down Newton's algorithm because it converges too fast. It can it can destabilize the problem. Anyway, so uh, descent algorithms work uh, if, you, if your step size is, is sufficiently small uh, on convex optimization algorithms, which is why convex optimization algorithms um, are easy. Okay. Now, you may say, well, what about, what about those constraints you mentioned? Well, okay, that's, that, that's true. Uh, constrained optimization is significantly harder than unconstrained optimization. And there's basically two approaches to dealing with constraints. Uh, the first is to put is is to to find that descent direction, but then project back onto the feasible set. So in this case here, we're finding a descent direction. Um, uh, let's see where is it. So here's our here's our uh, which which one is our descent direction? I don't know what these are trying to represent. Okay, so yeah, so this is the perpendicular surface of the constraint. Uh, this is the uh, this is descent direction. This is descent direction. And in each case, uh, we project onto the perpendicular to the, the constraint surface 
So we're constrained, we, we project back onto into a feasible direction along the constraint surface. We go a little bit, well, we've gone here, we've gone too far, but we move along this, this, we sort of slide along the surface, projecting at each step until we get to a point where uh, the, uh, the, 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 al the descent direction is in the same direction as the normal uh, to the, the, the surface. And they're moving in the same direction, and then you stop. So that's the gradient projection algorithms. Uh, they work pretty well. Uh, but you can leave the set. That's a problem. Uh, because, right, you project a little way, you're going to leave the set a little bit. You have to project back onto the set. Uh, the alternative are interior methods, uh, typically characterized by barrier functions. And this is where you move the, uh, move the constraint into the objective function itself. So that uh, the objective function, let's say, say this is your feasible set. Your objective function looks like you know, this or something like that for most of it. Uh, and then uh, the, the, you create this function where as you approach this, the edge of the constraints, uh, the, 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 the feasible set, uh, you have a function which goes to infinity at the edge of that set. So we have a barrier function, ideally, which is sort of a step, right? It's zero everywhere except right at the boundary where it goes to infinity, right? Or it's a constant here, here. So here it's zero. And then when you get to the edge of the feasible set, it goes to infinity. And you add that function onto the constraint, to the, the objective function. So you sort of add it in. And then obviously, if you're, uh, you're uh, optimizing that combined function, the added addition of the two, Right, this goes to infinity, you're minimizing the, the combination. And so you're guaranteed to sort of stay in the feasible set because otherwise, right, right, infinity is not optimal if you're minimizing things. Uh, so one, uh, the, 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 perhaps the most common, uh, did it again. Uh, the most common uh, barrier function is this log one, right? Whereas uh, as g gets closer to zero, right, greater than or equal to zero, uh, the log goes to infinity, right, so the common one. And it's relatively small uh, uh, out when g is, is away from there. So, I mean, this is like a vast simplification of a huge class of barrier functions. For uh, SDP, right, the barrier functions are log debts. It, it's all, all sorts of complicated. But generally, these are known as interior point methods, and they work, again, pretty well. Uh, the central path algorithms are sort of the, uh, the ones we typically use for SDP. So if you're really interested, you can look up central path. I'm not going to talk about it. Basically, you, you wait as you, you wait more as you get, uh, or less as you get closer and farther from the barrier. So there, there, there's proofs of convergence and yada, yada, yada. Um, if the problem is not convex, bad things can happen, right? Uh, so convex works, non-convex uh, has problems. And basically descent algorithms don't work very well, right? Uh, the primary reason, so here's a non-convex function, is you can get stuck at local optima. And the logical optimum can be caused by non-convexity of the function, as we have here, right? So obviously, if you're descending, right, uh, you're bouncing back and forth, you get to this minima here. It can't improve anywhere locally, so the algorithm says you're done. But in force, of course, the, the real optimal is over here. And there's all sorts of heuristics to, to get out of local opta for non-convex optimization. And then you, you pay the you know, Garobi and, and, and Express and, and Cplex the big bucks, to, uh, to, to, to find uh, sort of heuristic ways out of your local optima. But, um, uh, but, but uh, if you only have one optima, if the problem is convex, uh, then you, you don't need any of that stuff. All right. So next, uh, so convexity uh, or, or local optima, uh, getting stuck, algorithms get stuck due to non-convexity of the objective function, so it's objective. And they also get stuck by non-convexity of the constraints. So here, for example, we have a linear objective. Linear objectives define a descent direction, which is like perpendicular to the, uh, to the, the hyperplane C. Um, so the, so uh, the algorithm is always trying to, to, to go in this direction. It starts at this point, right? Uh, goes uh, maybe, oh, sorry, that's not really, it goes in that direction, right? Gets over here, it runs into the constraints, so it just starts doing its gradient projection thing, and then goes uh, that way a little bit. Actually, switch to black. And gets stuck at the constraint, projects forward, and uh, if this was your starting point, you would actually get to the, the globe optimum. It's the globe optimum is here. This is the, the most uh, far in this direction you can get within this constraint set. However, if you started, say, uh, here, right? Started here, 
you would run into this constraint, you project along it, uh, you get to a new constraint, project along it, and eventually you get to this point where you can't, now you can't improve on your objective function by going any direction which is feasible. And so you'd, so you'd return this as here, as your global optimal, but you'd be wrong. Right. And again, optimization algorithms are generally dumb and they, they, they stop, they don't, they can't look beyond the wall, right? They can't see this point over here, so they just have to stop. And all of these heuristics like particle swarm and evolutionary algorithms and all the rest of it are, uh, are ways of sort of scattering, uh, initial seeding, ways of getting around that, but none of them are very good. All right, so now we've defined, almost done here today, uh, we defined, uh, oh, I'm actually a few minutes over time. Uh, I don't know how that's going to work. But uh, so we defined uh, what are easy problems, which are hard problems. Uh, P are easy, uh, NP are hard. And, uh, and so after today's lecture, we're just going to discard all the hard problems and focus on the easy problems. So the first homework has hard problems in it, but no future homeworks will. So hopefully after today's lecture, you'll be able to identify hard problems, or at least after doing the first homework, because they still come up and we have to fi somehow find a way of turning those hard problems into easy problems. Right? Or turning the formulation of a hard problem into a convex formulation, which is then easy. Right. So what are the easy problems? Well, uh, there's uh, several classes. Uh, the LP, linear program, is the classical one. This is for we can solve really big problems, 10,000 variables uh, in, in C. Uh, and this is linear objective, right? Linear objective uh, and linear constraints where the positivity uh, is a vector positivity, uh, x uh, greater than y if uh, xi is greater than yi uh, for all i, right? So these are vectors in Rn not matrices. So linear programming is optimization over vectors with vector constraints. Right? Very efficient algorithms for solving uh, linear programming. Uh, this uh, actually, the ellipsoid algorithm is the one everyone uses. Uh, no, sorry, the simplex algorithm is the one everyone uses. That's been around since the 50s. Right? Right? And uh, fastest. It's the fastest. Basically, uh, the, uh, for linear program, uh, the uh, the solution will always occur at one of these vertex. So this these are the this this is the objective function. Uh, these are values of the objective function is improving in that direction, um, and uh, this is the feasible set defined by inequalities. And the uh, solution always occurs at the intersection at one of these nodes, these vertexes. So basically, uh, the, uh, the the simplex algorithm starts at a point. Uh, finds the, uh, the starts at a point, finds the, uh, the the facet of fastest increase, goes to the next vertex, skips straight to the next vertex. It's not a descent algorithm. Skips straight to the next vertex, looks for which direction it's decreasing faster. Skips to the next vertex and converges very quickly. It's not actually the algorithm is not actually provably polynomial time uh, simplex algorithm, um, but it works. It works very very well. In contrast, the, actually, the ellipsoid algorithm is polynomial time, but doesn't work quite as well as the, uh, the simplex algorithm. So it's typically people use the simplex algorithm. And you can solve really big problems. Tens, hundreds, that's uh, uh, millions of variables. I, I said 10, 10 to the eighth probably variables uh, you can solve for this. A lot, really big problems. All right. Uh, yeah. So um, right, I'm going to come back to this, 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 this thing in just a second. Uh, list of solvers for this problem. Those are two. Uh, there's more. Um, other convex problems include quadratic programming. That's where you have a quadratic objective, but it's convex if that Q has all positive eigenvalues. Right? Symmetric and has positive eigenvalues. Right? Then the function is convex and uh, relatively easy to solve. Very, very can solve very, if it, very big problems. Uh, of this form. Uh, so if Q is not positive definite, then it's actually NP hard, right? So it's very important that the Q be convex, right? Otherwise, you're, 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 you're out of luck. Um, 
Getting away from the convex ones, there are very common ones which are not convex. Uh, so examples of those include uh, uh, the uh, mixed integer linear programming problems. So one of these is the max cut one that we were talking about. Right. And that's where we have a linear objective. Remember, our, our objective function was actually linear. Um, actually, no, wait. Uh, I think the objective function was quadratic. So actually, it's not quadratic. Let me erase that. Oops. Uh, but it was a it was a it was a it was a, it was a, it was a, a mixed integer program. Right here, the uh, were, the variables are constrained to be integer. They were actually they were constrained to be binary. Um, so that means there are 0, 1, 2, 3. And obviously, if you have a constraint like this in your set, the set is not convex, right? You can take this point, right? You can take this point, you can take this point, take the, the values between them. Obviously, none of these are feasible, right? So in fact, very not convex because none of the, right, point, none of the weighted averages are ever feasible. Right? So this is a problem, very not convex problem. The rest of it, however, is relatively uh, benign, right? It's a linear constraint here, a uh, vector value constraint, linear objective. And so the rest of the problem is, is, is actually okay. The problem is, of course, right, uh, say this is your objective function, it's decreasing that way. Uh, the, uh, if you ignored the integer nature of the problem, you get to you get to a point here, actually here, right? You get to this point or you get to this point or something like that. And these are not, bot these are not integer variables. So what do you do? Well, uh, I, I don't know. That, 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 that's a good question. Uh, so you would well, you can't go. This, you can't go. This is the closest one, but it's not feasible. You have to be within the, the blue lines. Uh, so maybe you go over here. Is that the closest one? Uh, maybe you go over here. Is that the closest one? It's unclear. So there's all sorts of heuristics for choosing the closest uh, actual feasible point. But none of them, right, really solve the problem, and none of them are all like great. So mixed integer linear problem is NP hard, but there are very good uh, solvers for solving, and we'll come back to that benchmarking thing in just a second. Uh, if you get the next step is mixed integer nonlinear problems, and there are very relatively few solvers which do this well. Uh, so this is uh, so you have uh, again your integer constraints, but now you have uh, functions f and g, which which may not be convex. So this is just really the worst case, uh, mixed integer nonlinear programming problems, really hard to solve. So that's a, that's a, the last slide. We'll talk about the ones we're actually going to solve in this course. Uh, pro focus on them uh, next lecture. That's SDP, LMIs, and positive matrices. Um, before I quit, I just want to like uh, mention um, that. Uh, if you actually want to solve any of these hard problems, if you have a formulation as a, as a, as a mixed integer or linear problem or a nonlinear problem, uh, or you just want to solve an SDP solver or, or say even a polynomial sign, right? Then you got to you, you have to think very carefully about which problem, uh, which which solver you use, right? Typically, we're going to use Sudumi for all of our problems because it's not very um, it's, it works very well. You could also use Mosaic; it also works very well. Uh, historically, right, uh, at this point, I, I, I refer to, uh, uh, to Hans. Um, I, I guess I can't highlight now because this is, this, is uh, this is a web page. Uh, so you click through the link. And uh, Hans has, uh, he's at ASU, right, in the math department. And he has historically uh, uh, compared the, uh, the, the various solvers for these hard problems. Uh, the, the three most common being Cplex, uh, Garobi, Cplex is from IBM, Garobi is, uh, is their own thing, uh, wait, or is Express, and, and Express, I forget which one, uh, Express is their own thing, anyway, there are three of them, and uh, it's very competitive business, in fact, actually, it's so competitive <laughs> that uh, there's, a, there's a very funny story here, right, uh, just recently, right, this is, uh, since the last time I taught this class, I noticed, um, just recently, the, the, it got so competitive that, uh, well, uh, I think Roby was, was, uh, was making claims that uh, theirs was like two times faster than Express. Actually, you can see here, go to this little, um, his, uh, his uh, presentation on the subject. Very amusing. 
Uh, but uh, so competitive that like uh, uh, Plac, uh, Garobi tried to claim that theirs was uh, significantly faster and used uh, Hans' uh, benchmark uh, in, in, in a way which was irresponsible. So they took like selective cases where it was working better and, uh, and said these apply generally. And, uh, and Cplex and in, uh, in Express got so upset uh, that uh, it wasn't Hans's fault, right? Because they, they did it without his knowledge. Uh, but uh, they, uh, they got so upset that they, uh, they, they, I don't know if there was a lawsuit involved, but they, they, they uh, re revoked uh, Hans's license for all of their software. So now he can't do benchmarking on these, uh, on these, uh, these problems anymore. Uh, it started starting in 2018. So he just stopped benchmarking all three of them. And now, uh, now uh, you know, we take a tiny, giant step back and no one knows really who's fastest because they can't actually compare each other's, uh, compare the software. So it's, uh, it's really like, uh, I mean, they're all heuristics anyway and they're all junk, but uh, it's really uh, sort of a disappointing outcome there. Yeah. All right, well, anyway, so that's the end of the lecture. Uh, it looks like I've gone a little bit over time, so I apologize for that. Um, Next lecture, uh, so hopefully this will prepare you for the, uh, the workshop, and, uh, and then the next lecture we'll start talking about uh, a a SDP uh, and LMIs uh, per se. All right. Just turn this pretty.